Thank you guys for coming out. Today we're going to do a basic fishing course. Today's course is not necessarily to do a deep dive and figure out how the malware worked or what caused it or what really kind of malware it is. It's more on recognizing that it is malicious. And this is what you can use. Some of you are on here because you're working on a project to start up a phishing server. Others of you are here because you want to learn some of the basic skills needed to get a job, like as a SOC analyst, which is Security Operations Center, or a Cyber Threat Operations Center. And if you look up here, we have the Raleigh ISSA webpage, and you can just go up here and type phishing, and you can see here we have the presentation. Just click. Before we get started, I'm just going to go through the slides, any questions you have, and this is a basic intro into phishing. A problem. You receive an email from a credit card company informing you that your account has been deactivated because of suspicious activity. The message requests you click on a link and log in to verify your account information. Following the instructions, you are directed to what appears to be an online update page for your credit card. You enter your credentials. You can see here username, password. Uh, the problem many people fall into is these are usually a scam. A cyber criminal now has your information. They can sell it on the black market for really cheap. Passwords are, you know, 60 bucks for a thousand passwords or something like that. It's pretty cheap. They have people that verify that the passwords work. And once they do, then they can sell them for a little bit more money saying, hey, we've authenticated that these passwords work. They don't have dual factor authentication. Go ahead and buy these. You can get into their accounts. So this is a super easy way for criminals to get into accounts. Why is phishing important? So like we said, the goal of the class is to arm individuals with the knowledge to help self-guard themselves. And also, since you guys are all in the security field, to learn the basics of most security operation centers. According to a recently re released report on a sample of 8 million users, 30% of phishing messages were opened by the target across all campaigns, according to Verizon. A couple of testimonials of victims. So I actually met this Uber driver here. We went on an Uber and this Uber driver told us about all the times that she was scammed. Over $10,000. The first one, she thought she was paying for a dog, which never arrived. All these were emails she got in her inbox. She wanted to help a sick man come to America and she fell for a fake employer scam where she actually gave them her bank account and they were transferring funds into her account and then back out of her account, the Mule bank account. And then another one I heard about, is a bank employee who opened ransomware. Uh, the email was a spearfish. Does anybody know what a spearfish is? No idea. So a spearfish is a targeted fish. Instead of like the email going out to everybody, it would just come to me. And the whole point was to try and get my credentials. It's just a very targeted attack. With the case with the bank employee, the email happened to look like email the employee was expecting, or there's a group, you know, something that they normally get. A lot of these different emails can be found online, and so they're very easy to replicate. And all you got to do is go on somebody's LinkedIn, Facebook, find out what kind of stuff they're into, and then you can use those targeted attacks to get those people. Now we're going to go our phishing defined. What is phishing? Phishing is an email-based social engineering attack, where an attacker attempts to gain knowledge or perform malicious activity. Some of the things you can see on the screen are install malware. Uh, we talked about uh, how people can steal credentials gain remote access, fraudulently obtain money, and steal sensitive information. So here's a defined first spear phishing. The attacker targets a specific organization, person, or group of people using familiar information to establish a trust. Versus willing is where they attack the sea level. What are sea level? Does anybody else know what the sea levels are? Sea level employees? Sea level could be your CEO. Chief your financial officers. Yep, exactly. CIOs, all the important people. Chief operations officer, chief technology officer, you'll see all those. I mean, those are your whaling attacks when they're targeted just to those people. So time to execution. When you get this email, most of us don't always pay attention to our email right away. But on average, a person will open an email within one minute and 40 seconds and it takes three minutes and 45 seconds before they've clicked that link or attachment. A lot of people don't look, or it looks like it's somebody they know, or maybe somebody else's email is attacked, and they're like, oh, this person's supposed to send me stuff. Click, boom. They've now executed malware. 
According to Verizon, the top five items breached are credentials, secrets, bank information, medical information, personal information, and other information, which could be anything. Email best practices. The emails, you know, have your personal email, the one that you give out to employers that sounds really professional, and then have a spam email, one that you use for coupons, drawings, signing up for things, Facebook. Here, I actually brought mine up here for you. So this is my Yahoo. So I use this, if I go to the fair, I want to enter drawing, I'm signing up for whatever that doesn't use my credit card, anything like that. And you can see I have a ton of spam. They want to give me a $12.5 million. All my spam mail, they have very important issues. Think about that when you're giving your email address away. Definitely use two different accounts. And for those of you working on the phishing server within Raleigh ISSA, your server is where people are going to be sending those emails so that you can actually take a look at those. Email best practices. Verify your senders. Oftentimes when you click over the link, um, the bad guy can take your email and use a different email, but make it look like it was coming for your email. So they may not even have to actually hack into your account. They can just change what the display looks like. So always take your mouse and hover over the hyperlinks and verify they are what they say that they are in the sender. And if you know how to go into the properties of your email, each email engine is different. So if you want to learn how to go into the properties of whichever one you use, just go to Google and ask it how to open the properties. And you can take a look at who the actual sender is within those properties. So now let's go ahead and go into investigating emails. Types of phishing, credential harvesting, ransomware, virus. Uh, RAD is a remote access trojan. That's where I can actually command something from a remote computer. And then social engineering. And does anybody have any questions up to this point? It looks like uh, David has a question. He says, as it pertains to emails, is it okay to open the email and dangerous to click on the link? There are very few instances where you just open the email and it will actually infect your computer. Now it has happened, but usually it has to do with clicking on the links and being and the links themselves will execute it. So if we go over, so like this one has a, a link, right? So I'd want to right click, copy the email address or the link. That way I don't go ahead and execute it. And if you have anything on your computer like Kali, VMware, anything like that, it's always safe to go ahead and execute these within the VM environment so that if you do accidentally set off ransomware or something, you just wipe your VM and you start over. I have a question about that, Christy. Yeah. Um, so you say we could do it in VMware, but does it matter if we're using Bridge or NAT? Yes. Networking? Mm -hmm, it does. So you don't want your VMware to actually reach out to the network. Network ad address translation, you're connected to your school network. And that could be bad because you could potentially spread it. So just take your VMware offline um, once you get your stuff in there. And you can also set up a network within VMware that's just that just talks to itself. It's a little bit deeper on how you can actually go into that. That is a capability also. Okay, thank you. Characteristics. Here are a few characteristics. We talked about, look at who's set, sending the email. Up here, you can see it says that, hey, this is from the FBI. But if you look, it says FBI note at hands something text dot ml. That doesn't sound like anything the FBI would actually send to us. Urgency. You can see down here with the red light, urgency often discourages people from verifying information. They're like, oh, my God, I got to do this right now, you know, and, and people get scared. And so they click things and they start pushing things. And so urgency is definitely a trick that the bad guys use. Grammar, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, they will use bad grammar throughout the emails. Although the attackers are getting better, there are still several spam emails or phishing emails that contain bad grammar. And here you can see they have the executive governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Be wary of names used to impress, such as executives, CEOs, board members. These names are all found on company sites and can be easily duplicated. Here you can see it's requesting money also. The Central Bank in Nigeria, they're famous for their phishing emails. But yeah, it's requesting money for a foreign bank. Very common. Here you can see we talked about the links a little bit and verifying. You see this one looks like it's going to google.com, uh, Google Drive. 
And But when I hovered over it, I could see that it's, it's not going to Google it at all. It's going to a WordPress site. Anytime you see WP-content, that usually means that it's a WordPress site. We just talked about hovering over your mouse. And then here you can see the social media links. If you actually try to hover over them, if you would have had the real email, they were empty. There was nothing there. They were just there to make it look like it was a real email. Email contains grammatical error. Google space drive dot capital link. Just little things to pay attention to that you might see within the emails. Anybody want to give this one a shout on what's wrong with it? There's no recipient. This was not intended for you directly. It's probably just a blanket email sent out. Did you request any files? They'll often tell you, hey, you were supposed to send me this. Why haven't you sent me this? But if you didn't request any files, then why should anybody be asking you for anything? Documents often contain malware or malicious links. If you accidentally open one, never enable the macros and immediately close the file to avoid cl clicking anything and then run your antivirus scanner as soon as possible. And then most legitimate emails will contain a signature. Investigative steps with third-party tools. So this is where some of you guys that are on the call that are actually here to learn about, you know, what to do for those SOC positions, the CTOC positions, those entry-level security positions where you deal a lot with phishing and investigations. So we talked about it a couple times. You know, when you copy the URL, right-click over it. I know some mail engines won't let you right-click over it to save it, but always save it. Don't click it. Here you can see an example of what a right-click would look if I were to right-click over this email, and then I can just hit copy hyperlink. Left-click normally interacts with the emails. This is one of my favorites. It's called VirusTotal. Has anybody heard of VirusTotal? No? Well, VirusTotal, I know they're kind of small pictures, but you can see up in the corner here, you can do URLs or files. So if I've saved a file, if I saved a URL on the screen, I'm displaying what it would look like if you had a URL. This was the uh, URL that I put in there. It gave me an IP address. IP addresses are really good, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But one of the main things to know with IP addresses is you can find out where the site is located and how new it is. If a site's brand new, there's a good chance it's malware. Cause oftentimes, bad sites will be taken down pretty quickly, especially if they're hosting like GoDaddy, WordPress, any of those sites. They tend to get taken down pretty quick. So you know if it's a new site to be very wary of it. And down here on the bottom, you can see the red marks down there. Uh, it shows you that malware engines have actually found this to be malicious. Now on the right, you can see it's a clean site. Just because your websites say that it's a clean site doesn't mean it's not brand new. If it's brand new and, and Cisco hasn't caught it, Kaspersky hasn't caught it, and any of those other you know big virus companies, it could be just a brand new virus that nobody's seen. So don't take these tools as an absolute. They're just a guideline of what it is that they suspect. Here's what it would look like if you actually uploaded a file. So you can see this is my computer, and I created a malware do not open. So if I let anybody use my computer or anything, and I try to delete these as soon as I, I'm done with them, but you don't want to open these on, the, on your computer again. That could infect your computer, put you out of business, and if you can, use uh, VMware or Oracle Box. So you save it to the file, and then choose the location, and then you'll upload it to VirusTotal. So imagine I have a file, and I take a picture of it. And somebody else has the same file, and they took a picture of it. And we take a look at both pictures, and we want to make sure that they're the same. So what a hash is, is it gives us a number representation for that picture. The having to like look at it and try and see if there's anything slightly different with the picture, I can look at the two numbers and compare them to see if they're the same. And if the same, then I know it's the same document. So I can take that number and just throw it into plain, ordinary Google search and see if anybody else has seen this piece of malware and what it is that they were saying about it. So Google is your friend. Don't be afraid to research. I know it can be scary and just trying to do new things, but Google's your best friend here. And then this is one of my favorite sites. It's called URL Query. And what I like about URL Query is that it shows you the picture of the site that you're looking at. You don't have to interact with it. You don't have to do anything. It just shows you the picture. The downside of URL Query is the bad guys attack it every day at 5 o'clock. And so usually it has a, a DDoS. Does anybody know what a DDoS is? A DDoS is when 
I'm a bad guy and maybe I'm sending a bunch of internet requests or I'm doing a lot of pings from a bunch of different computers and I send so much traffic to this website that it can't keep up and it just shuts down. So they do that every day at five. If you're using this and you're practicing, just know around five o'clock the site's gonna get shut down. And when you look at this, I know the pictures are kind of small, but you can see if the website redirects. So sometimes it may go to a site and then it'll go to another site and then it'll go to another site. And you can run these different links and see what kind of stuff is going on and whether or not something actually happened at the site. Blacklists. These are lists that companies have put together to tell you if they think that it's, if it's bad or if it's good. They may give you a few other places to go research and find a little bit more information about the malware, especially if it's a little bit older. Uh, you can get more details on that. And right here you can see all these different companies labeled this particular one as phishing. Does anybody know of the types of malware we talked about earlier? What kind of phishing site is this? So this would be called a credential harvester. So you can see it, it mimics itself as a Google web page. And actually, you know, it, it's got the Gmail, but if you look at it, you can select who your email provider is. Google doesn't let you select who your email provider is, what one you want to sign in with. They'll just take complete screenshots off, off of pages and make them look identical with changing just a few things. And you can usually buy these websites offline for fairly cheap and then just upload them and they'll work. So you don't have to know any coding or scripting or anything like that. You just buy them and go. Like I mentioned, you can use any email provider. And then there's no copyright information down at the bottom. Uh, another sign that it's, it's malicious. For a lab, if you guys have emails at your house, you can go to your spam folder. You look for anything fishy. You can start investigating your emails. And then, you know, if, if you don't have anything, maybe you have a brand new email address or something like that, you can go to a site. I like this site. This is Fish Tank. You need to have a user login. You just create one with your email address. And then you can come down here and you can see I can copy the website. Let's go to Virus Total. Here's the URL. I just paste it. Okay, some sites don't like when you have the HTTP in it but we can choose different ones and you can just go through here and copy them and run into a bunch of different sites. Once you have an idea of what you think it is, you can click here and you can see this one had a redirect, which means it goes from one page to another page before getting to the page it was supposed to. And you can vote, is this a fish? Is this not a fish? So the rest of the PowerPoint that I have over here is just going into different resources that you have to use. More practice with fish emails, here covers a little bit about the fish tank, which we just covered, and then various tools. But I'm gonna go through a hands-on walkthrough of some of the tools that we have. So if you come to our Raleigh ISSA webpage, go to education, scroll down, you see how we have this investigative resources tab? Here we have actually labeled what kind of tool it is, whether it's a DNS or reputational. So your URL query, your virus total, those are all gonna be your reputational tools. So we can click on any of these and just go to the website. All right, another one, URL void. This is actually a very simple one. One scanning engine noticed it. Something to consider when you're looking at the different virus engines. Do they have a big name? A virus pretty famous, Bitdefender's pretty famous. Some of the little guys may or may not be as reputable and then just come through here, play with those emails, those links that you get off of Fish Tank, and practice putting them in different websites. Once you have all this, you can use stuff on your resume, such as use of third-party reputational tools, malware analysis, because although you're not doing a deep dive malware analysis, you're still analyzing the malware, and you're making a decision whether or not you think that it's malicious. One other tool I didn't tell you guys about is the Sandbox. So like VMware, you can go to these different sites and actually get a safe place to detonate your malware. So malware.com, it's a site that comes and goes, but it's really good. You can usually find results via the hash that we talked about earlier, that picture. Cuckoo Sandbox, that actually takes a little bit to download it. And then Forcepoint, it's just another reputational tool where it'll give you a report on the malware and what it saw. You can only use URLs for the free version. Hey, Christy. A couple of questions. He wanted a little bit more information on WordPress, if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Okay. WordPress is probably one of the most widely used engines to create websites. 
It's easy, it's simple, it's HTML. Some of the sites use PHP, Java. They're really flexible and you can do a lot with them, which is why so many companies use WordPress. However, that being said, you can get a free WordPress account. You can go to those sites, get an email that lasts for five minutes, use that, create your WordPress site. You can put any malware on it. WordPress does have a security team that's looking for stuff, but with the high numbers of malicious actors out there, it's hard for them to keep up. But they do take the sites down once they realize that they are malicious. And it's just another place for bad guys to put malware. Okay. Um, so uh, David said thank you. Uh, just any other questions you have, please put those in the chat. And if you guys have any questions, you can reach out to myself at membership at Raleigh ISSA, Rob at sponsorship at Raleigh ISSA, or reach out to Gwen if you're one of her students over at ECPI. Thank you, Christy. Are all the, I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone. Are all those slides that you went over on the ISSA site? If you just go to the search button and type phishing, it'll pop up. It'll be one of the top results. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful job. I appreciate it. You're welcome.